Welcome everyone to the Special Populations Core 2023 seminar series of the New Jersey Alliance for Clinical and Translational Science. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation, which is in collaboration with the Center for Population Level Bioethics here at the Rutgers Institute for Health, Healthcare Policy, and Aging Research. We are very excited to have Dr. S. Matthew Liao of the New York University with us to discuss the role of confidence and the hard problem of addiction. Before we jump in, if you have any questions during the presentation, we'll have time for Q&A at the end, so we ask that you hold them till that time. And to get us started, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Nir Ayal, Director of the Center for Population Level Bioethics, to introduce Dr. Liao. So Dr. Ayal, over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. It's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Matt Liao, um, a friend, a wonderful colleague, um, Matt is the Arthur Zittrin Chair of Bioethics and the Director of the Center for Bioethics and Professor of Global Health and an Affiliate Professor in the Department of Philosophy at NYU. He is the author or editor of The Right to Be Loved by Oxford University Press, Moral Brains, The Neuroscience of Morality, again with OUP, The Philosophical Foundations of Human Rights with OUP as well, Current Controversies in Bioethics with Routledge, and Ethics of Artificial Intelligence, with OUP. He's also the author of over 70 articles in philosophy and in bioethics. Um, Matt gave uh, both TED and TEDx talks in both New York and in CERN, Switzerland. He's been featured in the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Guardian, the BBC, Harper's Magazine, Sydney Morgan, Morning Herald, Scientific American, and other media outlets. He is also the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Moral Philosophy, which is one of the very best journals in moral and political and legal philosophy in general, not just bioethics. Um, I mentioned one little memory that I have just to give a bit of hope to uh, the desperate um, uh, junior folks on the on the call. Matt and I go a long way um, uh, together and uh, I, I don't know what, there was the APA, the big conferences of the philosophers uh, where desperate young people are seeking um, interviews for jobs. We were together there, I don't know, in DC, I don't know if it was 2000, 2002 or three or four, around that time. I remember both of us so, so desperate. And I remember um, Matt telling me, I, 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 don't, I don't need a great job. I just need a job. And, and it's kind of remarkable. Uh, I think he landed uh, really uh, firmly on his feet um, and I'm uh, delighted where I am. So uh, there is hope at the end of the tunnel and you could do wonderful work like the work that we'll hear about today. So please, Matthew. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Kylie. And thank you, Nir, for that really warm uh, welcome. And so it's a great honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, so I have uh, some slides. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Uh, let's see. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about the role of confidence in the hard problem of addiction, and I'll just launch right into it. Um, so before her addiction, uh, this is Mara Williams. She was a teenager who lived in a quiet suburban uh, neighborhood. She took piano lessons and could pitch a softball at over 60 miles uh, per hour. When she reached middle school, she began to have issues with anxiety, depression, and ADHD, and started the experiment with marijuana and alcohol. And one day, Marl's parents found cocaine in her room and decided to send her to a state-of-the-art treatment center. She briefly managed to stay abstinent, but died of a heroin overdose at age 19. This is Johnny. Uh, Bosquet. He was born with drugs in his body because his mom had been self-medicating with heroin after being sexually abused by her father and brother. Uh, despite Johnny's traumatic childhood, he thrived as a musician and a record producer. But when his wife left him, he took custody of their two children uh, and, and took custody of their two children. Johnny started to use drugs again, which he had done recreationally in the past and he became seriously addicted and ended up homeless. This is Kari uh, Chrysia. She was a suburban mom who became addicted to pain medication after giving birth to her second child. When her doctor discovered that she was abusing her medication, she resorted to stealing other people's prescriptions. And eventually, he, she moved into a decrepit drug house full of animal feces and sold drugs for a cartel to maintain her addiction. 
And the stories of Mara, Johnny, and Kari, uh, this is from a, actually from a documentary called Chasing Heroin, which you might have seen, illustrate some of the worst consequences that substance addiction can have on someone's life. And addictions can take many forms. Hundreds of millions of people around the world are addicted to drugs, legal or, legal, or illegal, such as alcohol, nicotine, heroin, cocaine, marijuana, and amphetamines. Um, in uh, 2021, uh, uh, over 46 mil uh, Americans aged 12 or older had a substance use disorder. So according to the DSM-5, substance use disorder is a cluster of cognitive, behavioral, and physiological symptoms indicating that individuals continues using the substance despite significant substance-related problems. And some of the criteria for this disorder include taking a substance in larger amounts or for longer than intended, a persistent desire to reduce or stop using the substance but not managing to do so, spending a great deal of time trying to get it or recovering from the substance, craving to use the substance, failure to fulfill one's obligations at work, at home, uh, because of substance use, continue to use despite it's call, uh, causing social and interpersonal problems, and, and so on and so forth. Now, substance use disorder can have profound negative consequences. As the stories of Mara, Johnny, and Kari demonstrate, it can harm people's health in both the short and the long term, impair their judgment, and lead them into risky behaviors and strain their relationships with their family and friends. Now, of course, many of those with addictions are aware of the negative consequences. And while not all want to give up their addiction, many do have such aspirations. And of those who aspire to give up their addiction or not relapse, many struggle sometimes for their entire lives to overcome it, and some never succeed. So indeed, 17 years into her addiction, Kari found herself in a drug court, a system designed to divert uh, low-level drug offenders away from jail and into treatment. And after completing the requirements set forth by the drug court, and only a few days before her graduation, Kari was found with opioids in her system. So what is addiction and what makes it so difficult to overcome for those who want to overcome it? There's a somewhat easier problem of addiction, which involves explaining why people decide to take addi addi addictive drugs in the first place. And this problem is easier in the sense that the explanations of why people begin to take drugs seem straightforward. So they do it you know, because to facilitate recovery from, uh, uh, from and coping with psychological stress, self-medication for mental struggles, peer pressure, pleasure, curiosity, and sometimes enhancement, and so on. Now, comparatively, I think there's a harder problem of addiction, which involves explaining why people with addiction who want to quit or not relapse uh, struggle to do so. And this explanation is harder because usually when we want to stop or not engage in a behavior, we're able to do so. So for instance, when someone learns that she is lactose intolerant, she can typically stop drinking milk. But many people with addiction, such as uh, Mara and Kari, found it enormously difficult to overcome their addiction even when they want to quit or not relapse. And so I refer to this as the heart problem, recognizing, of course, that there are many other difficult problems in addiction. Now, um, it might be thought that there's a really simple explanation to the hard problem, namely the pains associated with withdrawal cause people to relapse. And it's certainly the case that withdrawal can prompt people to consume drugs. But some people with addiction, such as, as, such as Johnny and Kari, relapse even after several months of being abstinent when they were no longer experiencing withdrawal symptoms. And that's uh, the phenomena, phenomenon that I'm interested in. So in, in this talk, I'm interested in explaining why people who are currently not experiencing withdrawal symptoms still find it difficult to give up uh, their addiction or not relapse. So what's a good explanation of this? So let me begin by considering current models of addiction um, and whether they can explain this particular problem. 
So a popular model is uh, under, uh, of addiction understands it as a chronic relapsing brain disease that's characterized by a compulsive drug seeking and use despite harmful uh, consequences. So on this model, drug addiction is a brain disease because drugs damage the brain structures underlying impulsive goal-seeking goal and self-control, causing them no longer to function normally. In particular, chronic drug use gradually alters the metabolism of dopamine, an important neurotransmitter for motivating and directing goal-seeking behavior. And so over time, people with substance use disorder tend to need to take drugs to experience an even, even a normal re level of reward. And moreover, chronic drug use uh, also weakens a variety of cognitive functions central to executive control, such as working memory and impulse inhibition. And as a result of this uh, change in brain chemistry, those with addiction often experience heightened cravings, withdrawal symptoms, and a certain irresistible compulsion to seek out drugs even when the experience of taking drugs is no longer as pleasurable as it once was. So with respect to the heart problem, the disease model suggests that people with addiction experience a compulsion to seek and use drugs that's often stronger than their desire not to use them. And as a, as a result, those with addiction often fail to give up their addiction even when they want to. Now, the disease model is attractive because it moves away from a moralistic model of addiction. So on a moralistic model, people with addiction have full control over their behavior and therefore they're fully responsible for the native negative consequences associated with it. On a disease model, however, given that people with addiction cannot resist the compulsion to use their drugs, they should not be held morally uh, fully responsible for their addiction. Now, in this talk, I'm going to set aside questions about the extent to which people with addiction are responsible. The issue I'm focused on is whether the disease model provides an adequate explanation of the heart problem. And unfortunately, I think there are problems. So first, it's not evident that the changes to the brain structure and function as, uh, associated with addiction and make it a disease. Uh, a lot of people have uh, made this point. And more importantly, there's evidence that drug-seeking behaviors are more voluntary and less compulsive than the disease model seems to imply. So it doesn't seem accurate to appeal to the idea of an irresistible compulsion to explain why those who want to give up their addiction or not relapse uh, still struggle to do so. So another alternative uh, to the uh, is the choice model of addiction. And it begins with the idea that people with addiction have some agency and control over their addictive behavior, but the agency is compromised to some extent. Um, so one story, which draws on research from behavioral economics, says that ordinary rational agents have a general propensity to choose the immediate future over the more distant one. So Gene Heyman calls this uh, choosing locally rather than globally. So with respect to the problem, this account suggests that people with addiction uh, can have trouble uh, not, you know, uh, you know, struggles with quitting or not relapsing because they continue to choose the immediate positive effects of drug taking instead of delaying their gratification so that they can reap the uh, uh, future reward of avoiding its negative consequences. Now, certainly most of us have this tendency to choose locally rather than globally. But most of us are also generally able to choose the more distant future when we want to. Um, so a choice model of addiction needs to explain why addiction makes it far more challenging to choose the more distant uh, future, especially when drugs are concerned. Otherwise, its explanation of the heart problem would seem to be incomplete. And indeed, Don Ross, an ad advocate of such a view, agrees and proposes that in addition to the fact that those with addiction uh, tend to choose locally, uh, we also need to pay attention to the neurocellular dynamics of addictive choice uh, to, uh, to explain a further property of addiction, namely preoccupation and crowding out of attention to alternative activities and objects of thought. So given this, others and uh, 
Others have looked to other factors that could impact one's agency to explain the heart problem. So to give an example, Neil Levy proposes that those with addiction are subject to recurrent losses of control over their mental states. In particular, people with addiction shift from judging that they ought to abstain from drugs to judging that they ought, all things considered, to consume in a particular case. And Levy argues that this judgment shift is not a rational response. Instead, it's the result of a dis dysfunctional reward valuation system. So I agree with Don Ross and others that the dichotomy between the disease model and the choice model is overstated. And like Levy, I also believe that the explanations of the heart problem should include other factors that include that, that could impact one's agency. So in this period, what I want to do today in today's talk is to present some additional factors that uh, in people's agency that could enable us to have a fuller explanation of why the heart problem is so hard. So in particular, I'm going to identify two phenomena that many of those who struggle with addiction um, uh, experience, namely the phenomenon of overconfidence and underconfidence. And I'm going to argue that these two phenomena can shed further light on why people find it difficult to overcome their addiction or not relapse. Now, just to forestall any misunderstanding, I'm not going to claim that these two phenomena can by themselves explain the heart problem. My view is more modest, namely that uh, these two phenomena can further our understanding of the heart problem. Okay, so a common phenomenon that many of those who want to quit or not relapse is overconfidence in their ability to control their drug consumption in certain situations. So think of an individual who is uh, thinking about whether or not to have another drink, despite knowing that he struggles with alcohol and wanting to quit. Now, say that he decides to have another drink. What went through this individual's mind that led him to consume? Did he simply feel compelled to do so with little or no control over his behavior? Or did he crave alcohol so much that he found it irresistible despite his desire to give up his addiction? Now, in many cases, it seems that a more complete story of this individual's thought processes would include his believing that he can manage just one drink without undermining his goal of quitting or not relapsing. Now, of course, he's likely to have similar beliefs about his second drink and his third drink and so on. And before he knows it, he has failed to quit or not relapse. So let us call this belief of I can handle another drink or another shot or another hit and so on, even when one wants to quit or not relapse, the phenomenon of overconfidence. Now, when individuals who want to quit or not relapse experience overconfidence, they overestimate their abilities. Specifically, they believe that they have more agential capacity to consume a given addictive substance without undermining their goal of quitting or not relapsing than they actually do. And as far as I can tell, an, an, an individual uh, experiencing overconfidence is compatible with, for example, her wanting to give up her addiction. So to see this, consider an analogy from eating disorder. Suppose that a person wants to lose weight and then sees a plate of chocolate cookies. He may believe that having one cookie will not undermine his goal of losing weight. And he's probably right. But before he knows it, he has eaten more than one cookie and undermined this goal. In other words, he was overconfident in his ability to handle, handle eating cookies. As uh, Levy has helpfully observed, a desire to give up an addiction can come up with a number of implicit escape clauses that allow an, an individual with addiction not to follow through with her resolution. So for instance, an overconfident person who wants to quit may believe that, hey, using drugs once will not cause her to do it again. She may also believe that she's better equipped to handle drugs on a particular occasion than her peers. So in a study that investigated how much willpower and self-control those with substance use disorder believe they have, many respondents describe relapses as involving a kind of hubris. And as, a res as one respondent said, and this is on the slide, I thought I was doing really well and I didn't have to do all that stuff to stay clean. 
So the phenomenon of overconfidence can offer a fuller picture of why many people who want to give up their addiction or relapse nevertheless struggle to do so. Now, while those with addiction often experience overconfidence, uh, they, all, they also all, uh, experience, uh, sometimes also experience underconfidence in their ability to function without drugs. So take an individual with addiction who just woke up. She may feel incapable of doing anything, such as getting out of bed and planning her day until she has consumed drugs. Suppose that she decides to do so. Again, one might ask, what went through this individual's mind that led her to consume? Did she feel compelled uh, and therefore unable to control her drug taking? Or did she crave the drugs so much that she was unable to resist her desire to use them? In many cases, it seems that a more complete picture uh, would include her believing that she needs drugs in order to function and carry out basic tasks. In other words, when people with addiction experience un underconfidence, they believe that they're incapable of exercising agential capacity, such as executive control, until they have consumed drugs. So for our purpose, the phenomenon of over underconfidence also sheds light on the heart problem. When an individual with addiction believes that she needs to get her fixes in order to exercise her agential capacities, her consumption of drugs becomes something of a necessity. And when people with addiction regard drugs as a necessity, it's not surprising that they would find it difficult to stop using them. And here I just want to mention that you can be both overconfident in your ability to handle drugs and underconfident in your ability to function without drugs, because these involve judgments of different abilities. So the phenomenon of overconfidence and underconfidence are supported by research from studies on self-efficacy and metacognition. And as we shall see, they also seem broadly compatible with current research on brain regions and neurotransmitter. So let me start with uh, sort of the uh, studies from self-efficacy. So the concept of self-efficacy refers to one's belief about one's ability to succeed in certain situations or to complete a particular task with the emphasis on the beliefs that one has about one's ability rather than one's actual level of ability. So this is from Albert Bandura. And researchers have identified several kinds of self-efficacy. The relevant for one for us is abstinence self-efficacy, which involves beliefs about one's ability to abstain from using a given uh, uh, addictive substance. And generally, what researchers have found is that self-efficacy predicts treatment outcomes. So in particular, high self-efficacy tends to be correlated with lower rates of relapse, while low self-efficacy is correlated with higher rates of relapse. But what's really interesting for us is that when you have excessively high levels of self-efficacy, this can also lead people to become overconfident and undermine those efforts. So for instance, there was a study that investigated the relationship between self-efficacy and long-term success in 381 smokers who attempted to quit. And it found that as the levels of confidence rose beyond certain threshold, so too did the likelihood of relapse. Or there's another study involving recovering smokers who had overcome withdrawal cravings and abstained uh, from smoking for at least three weeks. And it was found that those who perceived uh, uh, themselves as having a higher capacity for impulse control reported less avoidance of smoking temptation. And as a result, they were also more likely to have relapsed four months later. And so according to the researchers, relapse often occurs with these people with really excessively high level of self-efficacy because once people's withdrawal cravings fade, they begin to overestimate their capacity to overcome no novel cravings. Um, and they tend to overexpose themselves to, to drug-laden temptations. For, for, so for example, visiting places that they associate with drug use. So indeed, in a different study that measured uh, self-efficacy of those who had recently quit smoking in, the, um, uh, in their ability to resist smoking in high-risk situations, it was found that excessive uh, self-efficacy often led to, and I quote, inappropriate complacency about 
of the adequacy of one's skills for coping with difficult situations, resulting in relapse. And in another study that experimentally manipulated the beliefs of people who drink heavily uh, about their drinking restraint, it was found that those people who were led to believe that they had a higher level of restraint subsequently consumed more beer than those convinced that they had a lower level of restraint. And the researchers argue that this supports the idea that individuals who overestimate their control over drinking are at a greater risk of drinking excessively when exposed to a tempting situation. And interestingly, I'm going to talk about this later, there's also evidence that attempting to bolster people's inhibitory control can sometimes be a backfire if it causes them to become overconfident. And so for our purpose, I think the research on self-advocacy supports uh, in particular, the phenomenon of overconfidence, um, because believing that one can control one's drug consumption uh, and, one, and that one is more capable of handling oneself in tempting situations, even when one is trying to quit or not relapse, are paradigm examples of believing that one has more agential capacity to handle drugs than one actually does. Another line of research that supports the role of confidence in explaining the heart problem is the work on metacognition. So metacognition refers to the knowledge and cognitive processes involved in the control, modification, and interpretation of thinking itself. And it has at least two components, metacognitive regulation um, and metacognitive uh, cognitive knowledge. So the former refers to one's strategies for regulating or controlling one's thoughts, and the latter consists of one's beliefs about one's own thoughts. And two types of research on metacognition support the role of confidence in explaining the heart problem. So for example, the self-regulatory executive function, so this is the S. REF framework, according to which drug-seeking behaviors are strategies to control unwanted thoughts and emotional states. And this framework hypoth uh, hypothesizes that certain positive and negative beliefs are associated with the activation and maintenance of coping strategies and coping behaviors that perpetuate addiction and make it difficult to quit. So positive beliefs might include uh, things like drinking makes me think more clearly, drinking helps me to control my thoughts, drinking helps me to focus my mind, drinking reduces my self-consciousness, and drinking reduces my anx anxious feelings. Examples of negative beliefs uh, that can perpetuate alcohol use, including things like my drinking persists no matter how I try to control it, or if I uh, think about drinking, I'll get a bottle. And similar types of metacognitive beliefs can be found in people addicted to other substances. So the belief that consuming drugs can enhance one's agential uh, capacity is supported by self-reports of people with addiction. So for instance, there was a survey of 372 uh, people, regular ecstasy users in the UK and it found that 76% associated speed with increased energy and wakefulness. And 50% considered crystal meth to increase energy and 46% perceived cocaine to boost confidence. Sem similarly, 75% of those who respond to a question about speed commented that increased energy is a benefit of using drugs. So for our purpose, positive beliefs such as drugs make me think more clearly and drugs help me focus are precisely the kinds of thoughts that people with addiction experiencing underconfidence are likely to use to justify their consumption. At the same time, negative beliefs such as I cannot control my thoughts about drugs and I cannot function without drugs help to perpetuate addiction by making the positive metacognitions of those with addiction all the more salient. Now, to be clear, I'm not claiming that these beliefs are false. And they, that could actually that drugs can enhance cognition is well known. In fact, it's not uncommon for people to report that their substance use prevented them from killing themselves. Uh, it helped them cope with severe trauma or, or anxiety, or helped them with uh, perform uh, better at work. Be that as it may, a person with addiction who is experiencing underconfidence is prone to believe that she cannot complete basic tasks or think properly until she consumes drugs. And the sense of lost control and inability to function 
characters, characteristic of underconfidence makes the positive belief um, that drugs will enable one to function again, appeal, uh, it makes it more appealing and urgent. So I think the SREF um, framework supports the idea of uh, uh, that the phenomenon of underconfidence um, can play an in, uh, important role in explaining the heart problem. The second type of research related to metacognition involves insight, which is the ability to introspect and monitor one's own performance. In substance addiction, people who lack metacognitive insight tend, among other things, to downplay the severity of their problem, even when they decide to seek treatment. So as a result, they might not be very motivated uh, to maintain their treatment. So for example, there's a study of 65 patients with cocaine use disorder who, began the, who had begun their treatment, and it found that those with lower insight regarding their addiction had more problems sustaining their motivation. So for our purpose, impairments in metacognitive insight leading to the false belief that one is in control of one's drug-taking behavior can explain how people with addiction can become overconfident in their ability to handle drugs, even when they want to quit or not relapse. Okay, so before continuing, let me also say something about the neurobiological evidence that supports the role of confidence. So as far as I'm aware, there's no scientific study that, been, that has been conducted because uh, this is sort of a new proposal. Um, but this said, there's some reasons to believe that current research in neurobiology is broadly compatible with the idea that confidence is involved in making the heart problem even more difficult. So for one thing, research in neurobiology suggests that dysregulation in the human prefrontal cortex, so PFC, which underpins exec executive functions such as planning, decision-making, problem-solving, and self-control is associated with increased drug seeking and use. At the same time, researchers have found that a subject's judgment about her confidence in her decisions, herself and so on, also tend to involve the PFC. Now, to be clear, these studies are about the subject's confidence in their decision-making generally, and not necessarily about their confidence in their ability to do certain things. But it does not seem unreasonable to think that confidence judgments related to addiction are localized in the same similar brain regions as other kinds of confidence judgments. Then suppose that this is correct. So it may be the case that uh, excessive drug use could affect the PFC of a person with addiction in some way, and in doing so, affect the accuracy of her confidence judgments, both generally and specifically with respect to her addiction. And I leave it open whether this effect of excessive drug use on the PFC is pathological or not. Uh, once a person's confidence judgments regarding her addiction are affected, she might come to make overconfident judgments about her ability to handle drugs or make underconfident ones about her inability to function without them, thereby, thereby making quitting or not relapsing more difficult. In addition, drugs such as opiates, alcohol, nicotine, amphetamines, and cocaine have been found to significantly increase the amount of dopamine present in the brain's reward center. So as a result, subjects addicted to a range of substances tend to have a below average dopamine D2 receptor availability. At the same time, studies have found that dopamine affects confidence judgments generally. So for instance, stimulating dopamine receptors can inflate people's confidence judgments, which can result in overconfidence, while inhibiting those receptors can introduce doubt and attenuate overconfidence. So since excessive drug use uh, makes one's dopamine uh, receptors less available, and given that lower dopamine levels can make one more underconfident generally, it could be the case, and here again, I'm speculating, that low levels of dopamine receptors as a result of excessive drug use uh, could make people with addiction more un underconfident generally uh, and specifically with respect to their ability to function without drugs. And if so, this could make uh, the heart problem even more difficult. And to conjecture further, since most drugs are known to increase the amount of dopamine in the brain, it could be the case that those experiencing underconfidence in turn to drugs in order in part to boost their dopamine levels. 
As a result, however, the drugs flooding their dopamine receptors could cause them to become more overconfident. And when people with addiction have not used drugs for a while, it could be the case that their dopamine levels would increase, which could make them feel more confident in their ability to consume drugs without serious repercussions. So these factors could lead to those struggling with addiction to oscillate between underconfidence and overconfidence, thereby creating a negative feedback loop. Now, again, this, these are just speculations and additional research is needed. But for our purpose, though, current research on PFC and dopamine seems to suggest that there could be neurobiological pathways by which drugs could affect the confidence judgment of people with addiction. So now I'm going to um, address some objections, and then I'm going to conclude and uh, you know say, make sure that we have enough time for this uh, Q and A. So first, some people might think, "Hey, this proposal is not very controversial." After all, as I uh, as I noted above, I do not claim that these phenomena by themselves solve the hard problem. So it might be thought that addiction theorists can happily concede that additional factors such as confidence can play a role in explaining the hard problem. So my, my thought here is that the goal of the paper is not necessarily to be controversial, but to highlight the role of confidence in explaining the heart problem, which as far as I'm aware, has been underexamined in the literature. And in addition, as we shall shortly see, the role of confidence could also provide novel insights for treatment. Moreover, it seems worth pointing out that other claims made in the literature are, uh, do not also seem particularly controversial. So for instance, consider the claim that those with addiction are sometimes in denial that drugs are negatively affecting their lives and limiting socioeconomic opportunities. Uh, and that limiting socioeconomic opportunities can make it more difficult to overcome addiction. These are no doubt important observations, but at the same time, they also don't seem very controversial in that they don't establish necessary and sufficient conditions for addiction. Yet, this is not necessarily an issue as it's generally recognized that the brain and behavior often have multiple mutually reinforcing causes. Okay, here's a second issue that people might have. Some people might think that one's level of confidence is likely to affect any decision one makes. And if so, it might be trivially true that confidence is explanatorily relevant, relevant for all of our actions and thus would not be specific enough to explain the hard problem. But the proposal here is not just about confidence generally, but about specific types of confidence regarding one's own agency. So namely being overconfident about one's ability to control one's drug consumption in certain situations and being underconfident about one's ability to function without drugs. As demonstrated above, the literature on self-efficacy and metacognition supports the idea that these kinds of overconfidence and underconfidence can make it more difficult for those with addiction to quit or not relapse. And so this suggests that, you know, what I'm offering here is not trivial. And so, uh, but consider an analogy on a choice model, substance use is the result of people's choices and decisions. Uh, given this, one could claim uh, that this model, it's trivially true that choice is explanatorily relevant with respect to addiction. But against such concern, it seems that a proponent of a choice model would rightly respond that she's not just talking about any choices generally, but specific types of choices. So for example, making temporally myopic decisions like choosing locally rather than globally. Here's another uh, concern that one might have. Um, you might think that the notion of self-efficacy is already discussed in the addiction literature. So what does the current proposal add to this debate? Well, while self-efficacy does feature in some literature, as far as I'm aware, it's not been discussed directly in connection with the heart problem. <clears throat> also, the research on self-efficacy tends to emphasize how low self-efficacy can exacerbate the problems of addiction, but not how excessively high self-efficacy can make it more difficult um, to quit or not relapse. And the current proposal combines these insights. Moreover, the proposal here doesn't just focus on self-efficacy, but also integrates a variety of other research, such as metacognition and neurobiology. All of this makes the contribution here different than what is offered by the literature on self-efficacy. 
Okay, here's another concern. So some people might worry that the phenomenon of overconfidence is really just a form of denial. In particular, people with addiction know from past experience that use, using their substance of choice is likely to lead to relapse. Given this, couldn't one just redescribe their belief that they can control and limit their consumption of certain substances as a form of denial? So here, I think it's helpful to note that there are two distinct beliefs here. So one belief is uh, denial. I don't believe that I have a problem with alcohol or whatever other substance at issue at all, or that I need to quit, okay? Overconfidence is a different belief. I believe that I have a problem with alcohol and, and that I should quit, but I believe that I can manage having one drink without undermining my goal to quit. Now, one can certainly try to claim that the kind of belief in overconfidence is also a kind of denial. Namely, I'm denying that I would relapse with just one drink. But while we may be able to redescribe overconfidence as a kind of denial, it remains the case that denying that I would relapse, that I would relapse with just one drink seems to be a different belief than believing that I don't have a problem with alcohol at all or that I need to quit, as the former belief accepts that one has a problem, while the latter denies outright that one has a problem. And since there are two distinct beliefs here, it seems more illuminating to restrict the notion of denial to people who outright deny that they have a problem and to apply the notion of overconfidence to people who accept that they have a problem, but you know, who on the occasion also think that they can handle uh, certain substances without undermining their goal to quit. Let me discuss one more concern. It might be thought that when one believes that she needs drugs in order to function, this is the same phenomenon as when people use drugs to cope with and reduce their psychiatric symptoms. And the latter is also known as the self-medication hypothesis. Now, while the two ideas share some similarities, I think there are important differences. So for one thing, the scope of the self-medication hypothesis seems narrower in that it seems to be applied primarily to those with prior psychiatric conditions. In contrast, the notion of underconfidence is applicable to non-psychiatric cases as well. And in addition, I think there are also two distinct beliefs here. So the self-medication uh, belief here says, I need to take this drug to reduce my stress and cope. The underconfidence says, I need to take this drug to function and get things done. The fact that one is trying to reduce stress and cope does not automatically mean that one is also trying to function and get things done. Of course, one may want to reduce stress in, and, uh, in order to function and get things done, but typically the self-medicating hypothesis is focused on reducing discomfort rather than enabling agency. Now, it goes without saying that um, Addiction is enormously difficult to treat, and it's really beyond the scope of this talk to offer a panacea, but I thought it might be worthwhile to just cons consider some potential implications of the current proposal for treating addiction. So for one thing, the proposal implies that the treatment of people, of those who are experiencing overconfidence, uh, might, might be different from those who are experiencing underconfidence. So for those who are experiencing overconfidence, the goal might be to lower uh, their inflated confidence to an appropriate level. And to, to, to achieve this, they could be made aware of their tendency to experience overconfidence and be provided with some means of reducing their confidence to an appropriate level. And interestingly, such ideas are reflected in some existing, though admittedly not uncontroversial treatment, uh, such as the 12-step program of AA and uh, NA. So for instance, the step one of AA requires people struggling with alcohol to declare their inability to control their alcohol consumption. And here I quote, we admitted we were uh, powerless over uh, alcohol and that uh, our lives have become unmanageable. Such a declaration could be seen as encouraging people with addiction who want to quit or not relapse to acknowledge their tendency to experience overconfidence um, and admitting to themselves that they are powerless also gives those with addiction some means of reducing their confidence. Um, in addition, these programs rem often remind participants that addiction is a lifelong struggle and that, and I quote, every day brings you one day closer to your next relapse. And this could be understood as an attempt to tempt down and discourage overconfidence in one's ability to manage drugs. 
Now, in addition, research on metacognitive insights suggests that to reduce overconfidence, one could try to enhance a person's insight regarding the severity of their addiction. So there's some evidence that such intervention is possible. So there's a study of 41 people who uh, had alcohol problems with lower insight, and half were under, uh, required to undergo five sessions of brief individual intervention focused on insight enhancement, while the control did not. And the research researchers found that insight levels among the intervention group significantly increased um, uh, while those in control did not, uh, in the control group did not change. And additional research is needed to show that insight enhancement can in fact help people with addiction, uh, um, um, you know, uh, be less prone to overconfidence. Moreover, the current proposal implies that uh, to treat those who are experiencing underconfidence, um, it could be helpful to boost their confidence to an appropriate level. And specifically, they could be made aware of their tendency to experience this sort of under underconfidence and be provided with some means of increasing their confidence. And so uh, when those with addiction experience underconfidence, it could be counterproductive to require them to declare their powerlessness over certain substances, as for example, the 12, a 12 step program might because such pro, uh, declaration could reinforce their belief that they have little or no control over their agential capacities, which cause them to think that they're incapable of quitting. And fifth, it could be important to make sure that the confidence of a person struggling with addiction is not altered so much that someone who, who is overconfident becomes uh, 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 underconfident and vice versa. Now, exactly how one helps these uh, uh, those who are experiencing underconfidence increase their confidence is likely to vary from individual to individual, but there's ample evidence that the rate of addiction is higher among those people who live uh, below poverty line or are un, uh, unemployed. Um, so it seems plausible that poverty and unemployment could be contributing to underconfidence, and if so, improving people's circumstances, for example, through welfare and housing support, could help them increase their confidence and perceive agency, thereby making it easier for them to uh, quit or not relapse. And, you know, finally, it might be worth investigating to what extent medications that influence one's level of confidence can help treat addiction. So there, um, you know, studies indicate that impairments in metacognition can compromise decision making and lead to inaccurate, inaccurate judgments about actual performance. At the same time, there's some evidence that blocking uh, noradrenaline uptake using medications such as propranolol can enhance the accuracy of people's metacognition. Now, of course, it remains um, to be seen whether blocking noradrenaline can also enhance metacognitive judgments about one's ability to function without drugs. But the question of whether drugs such as propranolol can help people with addiction um, could be a worthwhile research agenda. So let me conclude. Why do people, uh, so many people who want to quit or not relapse, find it difficult to do so? Uh, in this talk, I propose that paying more attention to the confidence levels of these individuals could enable us to have a fuller explanation of the heart problem. Many people who want to quit or not relapse tend to experience overconfidence in their ability to manage a given uh, addictive substance and or underconfidence with respect to their ability to exercise their agential capacities when they go without it. This proposal is supported by empirical research on self-efficacy and metacognition and seems co uh, compatible with what we're learning uh, in neurobiology. I also compare this proposal with alternative accounts of addiction and argue that it makes a distinctive contribution to our understanding of the heart problem. If all of this is right, paying more attention to the role of confidence in addiction can give us additional resources to explain and address the heart problem. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll stop, should I stop sharing? I'll stop sharing. That was wonderfully interesting, uh, Matt. Very rich, uh, even richer than the paper. Am I right? Uh, oh. Yeah. That's some um, kind of new bits. <laughs> um, I think the floor is open to uh, to questions. Um, Monica has. Uh, you know Monica Magalesh? Probably you do. Uh, uh, yeah. I I know know her. Hi. Very nice to meet you. See see you in person. We've corresponded a couple of times. 
<laughs> yeah, nice to see you. So I'm glad I got my hand up quickly because I think this will be more clarificatory. But I just didn't understand right at the end when you addressed the objection yeah. that you might think that your account extends to all kinds of things that aren't addiction. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. I see you going like, yeah. Right. I was kind of thinking it does sound like, um, or maybe you just didn't have time to you know, explain how you're separating addiction from any bad habit that a person might want to break that causes you know, adverse and maladaptive things that causes adverse circumstances in their lives that would fit your slide where you, you know, other than maybe being a substance. Um, um, so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about this. Um, sure. And, and the, also, in the, you know, towards the end, the behavior interventions you suggested or the, even the medication, sometimes they are used for things you wouldn't normally call addiction. Right. But that also seems to think, you know, maybe it's it just, I don't know, is there a problem for your account, yeah. even if it does right. apply more yeah. broadly, right? Is there, yeah, is there a great, problem? great question. So, um, you know, there's a debate in uh, addiction, whether, you know, addiction is pathological or not. And in this talk, I'm, you know, try, actually, I'm trying to be ag agnostic and you, you, you know, sort of put, put your finger on exactly you know, that weak point, you know, that sort of weak spot, uh, so to speak, where uh, I'm kind of hedging. Uh, some people think it's pathological, but uh, they're also like Hannah Picard thinks that, you know, we don't really have a good account of what a disease or what pathology, you know, is and, you know, and things like that. And so it's very hard to say that addiction actually is a pathology. And so her view is that it's not. Um, and if it's not, then you're absolutely right that addiction starts to look like a bunch of other problematic behavior, sort of like it's kind of on a spectrum, right? More like the other things. And because I'm also here not committed to the idea that addiction is a pathology, I seem to be, have that, I inherit that problem as well. And so you're exactly spot on. And I guess I want to sort of say that um, I, and I agree with uh, Hannah that I, we don't we need a better story of what a disease is, what a pathology is. Um, but what we can say here is like whether uh, choices, uh, w whether it's pathological or not, what we can it's it's a kind of disorder of choice, right? And it's um, the addiction, you know, like these things, the underconfidence makes it more difficult, whether it's pathological or not, to get certain things done. And so that's how I'm kind of. That's kind of how the narrative is going. So, um, and and then you could be right that um, this kind of overconfidence can uh, flow to other types of choice that are non-addiction related. And I think that's right. And we do see that. So I, you know, had a friend visiting uh, uh, from, uh, from Ajido. She's a professor of philosophy uh, at Oxford. And, she, you know, I was telling her about this, uh, my talk. And then she sort of said, Oh yeah, I, you know the underconfidence thing. I feel the same way about coffee. <clears throat> you know, so she's like, I feel like I can't do anything until after I have my, you know, cup of coffee in a day. And so that could be, you know, like I, I think that definitely is there. And so addiction might be a more extreme form where it's kind of impeding, you know, a bunch of different things. So, but thanks for that. I'm letting uh, uh, Nira, you want to moderate the, the queue, uh, you, you know, the people. So yeah. Dan, Dan is on next. And I want to also encourage people who are not uh, philosophers, like the first uh, three speakers uh, who want to come in from kind of more practical expertise. Uh, that would be fantastic. So Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, th thanks loads for the paper. I'm a little bit uneasy about talking about overconfidence and underconfidence, because it seems as if that suggests the notion that there's a right level of confidence, and then we have this problem that it gets too high or it gets too low, where in fact, oh, if I understood correctly, in your account, overconfidence involves a completely different belief than underconfidence. So we're talking about two different beliefs, and I'm not sure whether uh, thinking of it as uh, assimilating it to some quantitative notion of greater or lesser confidence, I think that may sort of obfuscate things where you have two different kinds of false beliefs 
which obviously have uh, enormous salience and uh, motivational force, uh, which uh, you know seem to be uh, definitely implicated in what you call the hard problem. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, yeah, I mean, do you have suggestions? I guess you know, like what 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 would you call it? So, I, I'm more interested in the phenomenon. So, the phenomenon is uh, that you know, people tend to be confident, like at some point they think, um, you know, like they rightly think that um, uh, they, you know, they, they, they shouldn't really touch the drink, like sort of like, when I think about drugs, I think, I, I don't want to go there, because I know that I'm not, I can't handle like, you know, I'll just get addicted, and then my life, life will be ruined. And that's what a lot of people think. But a lot of people, and, and at, at some point, at least for some people with substance use disorder, they get to a point where they think, ah, you know, maybe one drink or one hit or whatever, that's not, like, I can do that, right? Um, and that seems, and that's what I'm calling the phenomenon over, we'll just stick with that, you know, sort of like the phenomenon over confidence. And it does seem to be a threshold notion, like, I'm okay with threshold notions. At least, I, I think you're absolutely right. There are two distinct beliefs here. So that's one issue. And then the other issue is whether they're thresholds. And it seems like that is a threshold notion, like, or at least I'm okay with thinking that is a threshold notion where I go from, where I think, no, I, I don't think I can handle it to, at some point I switch over and I think, oh yeah, I can have, I, I just have one, right? Uh, I fear I, I don't have solutions. I only, okay. had a, only had a question. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Dan. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> If, if no others uh, want to raise questions at this point, I'll, I'll ask uh, Matt. Um, I'm wondering, this is not an objection. It's an uh, invitation to consider um, kind of further, uh, further detailing of your, of your thesis in the following direction. You mainly focused on people who are overconfident or underconfident in a fairly stable way. So it's people who you ask, you know, on another day. Uh, about their level of self-confidence, and you get kind of uh, kind of high grades. But I'm i intuitively um, inclined to think that part of what's going on is that often when the person is considering taking the drug, is considering eating the cookie, something temporary happens to their level of confidence, to their maybe beliefs about the wholesomeness of the cookie and whether it's helpful or unhelpful, and things of that sort. Um, it's 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 a flicker of it's a belief if you want to call it that, but only for a moment. I'm inclined to think of some things like that as a temporary seeing as, so it's not even a kind of standard hmm. cognitive. Um, you know, it, 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 it's not something that the person would be wholly um, committed to if asked. Do you believe that you and other people are always able to stop after one cookie? And yeah, they would say, of course not, but yeah. but. In the moment, it looks that way, and yeah. that is the thing to characterize and and explore. Um, it's also something that it's not just easy to get rid of by convincing them through CBT, right? Uh, to have the correct belief. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a great question. So I think uh, you know the I guess the issue is whether someone could have like um, you know we can distinguish distinguish between explicit beliefs and implicit beliefs, right? And some people could. Um, and I, I think uh, you're definitely right that maybe uh, people might not be deliberately thinking about it. Oh, yeah, you know, I can handle it. But I, I, I guess my proposal is that there's at least an implicit belief that, you know, when you are deciding to take the, the you know, like to have another drink, you think, oh, yeah, you know, I think I can handle that. And that phenomenon, you know, just based on the interviews of people who think, oh, you, you know, like they thought that it was easier, you know, like these people who are trying to quit, uh, you know, they, uh, based on their behavior and what they've said about the, you know, what they've done, the phenomenology at least seems to be there. So, and so if we work backwards, it seems like the implicit belief is there, even if it's not explicit. So I think you're quite right that when people do things, they don't often like, you know, like consciously say, oh, I'm thinking about, you know, like I think I can handle this and therefore I'm going to do it, right? Uh, but I, I, like, it seems like uh, at least after the fact, when people are interviewed, they seem to say, oh yeah, you know, I, I thought that it was, it would just be fine and I didn't have to do all that work to stay clean and so on and so forth and et cetera, et cetera. So. 
All right. Well, we are at the end of our time, unfortunately, because these are really great questions. But I just want to thank everyone for joining today. And of course, thank you, Dr. Liao, for sharing your important work with the NJX community. Um, we're really grateful to, to have you with us today. And of course, to the Center for Population Level Bioethics for collaborating with us on this seminar. So thank you, Dr. Ayal and the CPLB team. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining. Take care. And we'll see you at the next seminar in the fall. Thanks, thanks everybody. everybody. Thanks so much, Matt.